Thank you very much, Nanny. Hi, hello everybody, my name is Nick Fine, and welcome to UX Brighton. Um, first of all, I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about UX Brighton. UX Brighton was my first UX conference in 2010 when UX, uh, UX Brighton started. Uh, it holds a very special place in my heart. I've met people who I've been in constant contact, David Fennell, uh, Amy, a few other people in the audience set here tonight. So um, this is a very special place and I'm delighted to be back here. Today I want to talk to you about scientific design. Now, you would have heard throughout today lots of people talking to you about design thinking. There's lots of this stuff going on. Today, I'm going to be predominantly talking to you about science thinking. If you want to tweet this stuff whilst we're doing this today, please do. I would actively encourage you to. Um, I like the feedback. Uh, I like the exposure. And if we want to get these messages out there into the world, please retweet this stuff. I'm also very noisy and very active on LinkedIn rather than Twitter. Um, if you want to get hold of me, that's almost certainly the best place. So without further ado, a very quick slide on me, who I am. Um, I, in other talks, I've not really gone into this stuff in too much detail. I put my life on a slide. Um, everything from about halfway up, people told me for most of my career that what I did before UX wasn't relevant. And actually, um, it's made me who I am today. So what you'll see up there is somebody who was an early spod, a very early geek, a pre-internet guy, a guy who lived through the internet, who is now um, working full-time in UX. So what you're going to get is a very much a kind of a perspective that comes from academia, IT, digital, all mashed into one, and obviously HCI, which is my specialist subject. This stuff looks boring, and I've deliberately made this slide to look boring, because what we're going to cover today is not boring. We, I need to go through some, de some definitions first of what UX is, and what science is, and then we're going to get the real blood and guts of this stuff. So, as Danny was telling you, I've got like 120 slides here. Initially, I thought this was a 40-minute speed talk, and it's actually 20 minutes. So I'm going to go through some of these slides really quickly and spend time on the really important stuff that I'd like you to take away with you today. So let's talk about some definitions very briefly. First of all, what is UX design? I'll bang through this. I think it was really important to create a level playing field because we have designers from all walks of life here, from your kind of Royal College of Art, Falmouth, Camberwell type elite designers. And I'm not being a polar about this, but across this spectrum of UX, UI, art directors, creative directors, UI, UX designers, we're all in this design world and it all means different things. So it's really important that we just be briefly encapsulate what I'm talking about. So at the highest level, I'm talking about the process of achieving optimal interaction. At the more practically applied, the lower level in your actual daily lives is the conversion of user needs into experience. Put those together, you get the process of achieving optimal interaction through the conversion of user needs into experience. Boom, check that box. What is science? All that science is, is a systematic method for acquiring knowledge, for learning about our world with a degree of confidence. A lot of people think that science is this big body of knowledge. And when you apply science to UX, I'm going to give you this rule book, this playbook of stuff that you can go through and apply on your projects. What I'm going to show you and clearly demonstrate and give you stuff that you can take away and use in projects tomorrow is that science is very much a way of thinking as well as this body of knowledge. And if you can incorporate these way of thinking into your thinking, it's going to turbocharge you into being a genuinely amazing practitioner. And finally, what is scientific design? Basically, it's applying scientific knowledge and principles throughout the design process, whatever your design process is. So these are some typical uh, scientific principles that we work by. Objectivity, and the classic one in UX is you're not the user. Rigor, attention to detail, or working to a level of confidence about how well you know something. Humility, being a facilitator, an investigator, a, 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 a scientist, not an expert or a guru, some kind of top-down genius. Uh, impartiality, cognitive biases, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Structure, talk about in a lot more detail, about a methodological progression and running from evidence, from data rather than opinions. All of these things and more lead you through to validity and reliability 
And those are the platforms for any successful design. And no one can argue that. If you're going to be operating on insight, it needs to be valid and reliable. So forget the fake news. Why is it important? Obviously, you need to know with confidence. Does my design work? Is the audience X, Y, or Z? You need to know for sure. You need real insight. And as a result, it makes products and services that perform well. As a designer, you might be asking all of these sorts of questions and more. What you need, and what I'm going to try to give you today, is a lens. It's an additional lens to an array of lenses that you've already got that goes in your toolbox. This lens allows you to distinguish truth from lies, reality from opinion, be able to understand what is fake news, what's real, what's not, what's utter bullshit. There we go. Um, you need this lens, you need this, these filters to be able to clear this stuff. And in our internet world today, in this information age, this filter is required more than ever because if you go to Medium and read any UX article, you'll laugh because most of them are absolute lies, bullshit, or just misrepresentations. It's somebody's one-point opinion sample of absolute garbage. So, sorry, I, I tend not to mince my words. Um, this is not me going, you guys are all shit. This is about science. So this is not a fight. And, and anybody who's seen me talk before have probably seen this slide a few times. I'm not here to get into fights with people. This is a love-in. OK? This is about design and science together, coming together in beautiful harmony. Because the relationship between design of inventing what should be and science of discovering what is, this interplay between the two of these things is where the magic happens. And this is the gift that I want to give to you. I want you to be able to balance your design, your art thinking, your design thinking, with science. Because when you do that, you genuinely create killer, killer UX. When I say killer UX, I mean money, exposure, attitude changes, what, personal pro career progression, amazing, good, beautiful things. And I know this for sure because I spent 10 years doing it, and it works. So today, I'm going to show you how you add science to your UX. So there you are, UX designers on the left. I give you science and boom, you're a super UXer. But I'm going to take it actually just one step further. We've talked about design thinking all day. Can you imagine what happens when you take your design thinking and we put the science thinking in there? It's IDKFA, God mode. OK, and I, again, I'm telling you this from a place of experience, a decade of experience. It only makes you a better person. It only makes for better project work. It's never going to do you any harm or make you a worse or a somehow limited practitioner. OK, so now I've given you the big science spiel, the big hard sell. What the hell has this got to do with UX design? What does this mean to me as a practitioner? Well, this is one of the huge takeaways. Science is about hypothesis testing. And I've heard other people, other speakers today, talk using the word hypothesis. The problem with the word hypothesis is that it's a bit stigmatized. It's a bit geeky. It's a bit too sciencey. And it, it, it isn't that approachable. It's not that accessible. So as a word, I want you to think about, th not necessarily throwing it out, but there's a much better synonym for the word hypothesis. And that word is idea. So whenever you hear the word hypothesis, just hear the word idea. Because for all intents and purposes, it's the same thing. So if we're talking about science and ideas, a hypothesis is just an idea. So therefore, science is merely about testing of ideas. When you uh, uh, sell it like that, it's much more approachable, much more easy to digest, to, to get hold of. The real difference is that science is really about structured idea testing. And that's it in a nutshell. It's just providing a little bit of structure to your creativity. So the science is in the structure. Now, I know loads of you are sitting there thinking, going, hang on a second, shut up. Structure is the worst thing ever. It gets in the way of my creativity. Um, it's my enemy. 
or structure kills innovation. Um, forget it. Or structure stifles ideation. And in no way is structure any of these things. Structure supports your creativity. Structure informs your innovation. And it feeds ideation. Okay, these are not negative things, it's a positive support. But wait, I don't have a PhD. Bullshit, okay? Absolute BS, that's a complete red herring. The fact that I call myself Dr. Nick has got nothing to do with this. You do not need a PhD to do science, okay? That's elitist thinking, it's garbage, it's not true. Anyone can do science, everybody should do science. As I've said before, there's no good reason to not do it. And if we come back to this quote here, science is more than a body of knowledge, it's a way of thinking, the salient words in there are science thinking. So the question then is, is how do you think like a scientist? And I'm going to give you five principles that I want you to incorporate into your thinking all day, every day, both personally and professionally. This is how you live your life, and these are frames of thought, the schemas, to be used all the time. Not just in your work bag, it's in your life bag. So these come from uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is, well, I don't want to say a mentor, because I've never met the guy, um, a role model of mine. Neil deGrasse Tyson came up with five simple rules when he re-recorded uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. The first one, very important, question authority. No idea is true just because somebody says so, including me, or Neil, or anybody else. Okay, questioning authority is very important. We're going to come back to that in a moment. What I'm going to do first is go through the five principles, then I'm going to give you some five very concrete examples of how to apply them in your UX or digital lives. Number two is thinking for yourself. Um, you've probably heard me shout this at people in the past. Think for yourself. People are too willing to accept other people's opinions and not actually question what's in front of them. Question it. Question yourself. Don't believe anything just because you want to. And believing in something doesn't make it so. And I think there's probably not a single head of digital in the UK that isn't guilty of that very last one. Test ideas from evidence. Now, this seems really obvious, but we live in a world where opinions roam freely. And we need to balance this off with genuine, validated evidence, valid evidence. If a favorite idea fails a well-designed test, it's wrong. Get over it. Right? That's almost the essence of agile right there, is you're failing fast, pivot. Number four, follow the evidence wherever it leads. If you don't have any evidence, hold judgment. Seems pretty straightforward stuff, this. It does not get applied in projects on a daily basis. And my favorite one is number five. You could be wrong, and you probably are wrong many times. Everybody makes mistakes. So these five principles are there to keep us from fooling ourselves and each other. But now, as I promised, let's go back. How do we stop from fooling ourselves with these five principles in reality? So, we talk about Extinction Rebellion, we talk about Animal Rebellion, I'm talking about User Experience Rebellion. Okay, true UXR. We have to challenge the digital dinosaurs that l dominate our lives. And I know I'm not pulling my punches here, but this is absolutely on point. There are too many people out there, heads of digital, marketing people, etc., who are ruling projects with opinions uh, and keeping us all constrained in boxes and ways of thinking which are keeping us very much in an old, less user-centric world. They're also propagating myths and legends, corporate myths and legends. So we don't do things that way because we do things this way. You have to challenge this stuff. It isn't going to make you the most pers popular person in the room, the most agreeable person in the room. And I'll put my hand up. You know, I'd, I've upset a few people by asking these sorts of questions. But if you want to move things forward, you have to challenge. So challenge your agile pod in the retro. The retro is there, as you've heard from other people today. Be honest. Get these issues out on the table. Yes, you're going to get crucified, but it's worth it, trust me. Challenge methodologies, the way things get done. Existing documentation, challenge other user researchers. Agency work. If you're working client-side and you get to see all this other agency work that's coming from all the previous years, challenge it. 
I do. You, if you're going to be building something or, or, or working off of the basis of this thing, your work is going to suffer as a result of the quality of the insight that you've got. Challenge it. And if, if the company is paying for it, bloody well you challenge it. Um, challenge authors, challenge standards. I've challenged GDS all the time. Again, it doesn't win me lots of uh, friends, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, challenge product owners and challenge other de designers. What I'm saying is, is don't accept the status quo. Don't accept knowledge just on face value. So challenges, how do you know that? Somebody says, make it blue. Well, how do you know that? All of our users want it red. How do you know that? Show me the evidence. How did it test? I consider this a personal win. If the team that I'm on and the hippo or the, 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 the stakeholder says to me, how did it test? You know you're educating upwards. You're managing upwards. You're doing the right things because they're now starting to ask the right questions, not I like it, let's go with it, which never really turns out that well. What was the methodology? And how many users in the sample? I mean, again, I'm coming from a user research angle, but there's all kinds of other challenges that you need to ask. This is a huge slide, okay? So questioning authority, challenging that status quo, creates the room to test ideas or test hypotheses that might improve the current situation. You can't make your life better, you can't make your user's life better if you just accept things as they are. So this leads to genuine transformation, proper, real transformation. Better working lives for us as, as designers and practitioners and better lives for the people who are actually using our products and services that we're designing. Everybody wins, but it means not accepting things the way they are, or at least asking those questions. Point number two, principle number two, think for yourself. That means challenging yourself and challenging your own preconceptions. And I'm doing this all day and every day. When I'm in the lab, I'm constantly blown away as my preconceptions get blown away. Uh, there has not been a lab session ever in the past 10 years where I haven't learned something or be utterly blown away and surprised. Okay? You never get to a point of expertise in our world. I mean, people call me an expert. I'm not an expert. I just know stuff and I've made lots of mistakes, but I'm still learning as hard as you guys. Um, work on opening your mind further. Just when I think my mind is wide open, there's something comes along that says, oh, crikey, I, I was being biased or judging or, or had some kind of preconception there. This is almost like mental gym work. It's not going to happen overnight. You have to just keep on at this stuff and keep doing it, and you will become a better thinker. Insist on evidence, and bloody well challenge that evidence too. I'm sure you've probably seen this codex. This, this is a summary of, co of cognitive biases, and it's by no means uh, an exclusive list. Get to know the effect that you have on the situation that you're trying to observe. The effect that you have as a bias is humongous. The nature of users and the biases that they have is huge. Um, just be aware of it. I, that's a whole, we can talk for hours on cognitive biases. So number three, test ideas uh, from evidence. Again, this is just about moving forwards on making decisions based on evidence. This one and the next slide about revising, adapting, pivoting is all critical lean, agile type methodologies. But you'll be amazed at how many people will bang on following really bad ideas because they're thinking, I'm, tr I'm waiting for some form of confirmation bias. So I'm going to keep testing until I get the res result that I want, and we end up ch on an absolute wild goose chase. I put Yoda on here because this is all about talking in absolutes. You could be wrong. And I'm frequently wrong. This idea of expert stuff is rubbish, just a facilitator of the truth. Um, avoid talking in absolutes. You can't say users always want this, users never want this, or, or whatever the thing is. It's because there's always an exception, there's always an edge case. Stay humble, because when you are wrong, if you've been all arrogant, it's gonna, that's a lot of humble pie to eat. Challenge and expect to be challenged, because as a challenger now, you should expect people to be challenging you. That level of defensiveness or positive defense is, a, is an amazingly good skill to have. You should be able to justify all of this stuff and also expect other people to do the same for you. Also, I find that the champion versus challenger model works particularly well. Um, if you want to try to convert a stakeholder by doing kind of an AB type test, this was the champion, this is what we've got live, this is BAU, this is the hypothesis or the idea, this is how it outperformed the challenger how the challenger outperformed the champion. Very easy, very simple for most stakeholders to get hold of. 
Now, I'm not going into Agile, don't worry, we've talked about way too much Agile stuff here today. But it is a modern project delivery structure. And the reason why I'm saying structure is because we're talking about science and adding structure to your creativity. So Agile is often applied really very poorly. Okay, I'll make a correction. Agile is almost always applied very poorly. Wagile, fragile, all of that stuff. This is a fact, right? No one here is gonna lynch me at the end of this for, for even suggesting this. There's too much ceremony. The structure is not necessarily a good one. So this begs the really important question for all of us. How can Agile work better for us as UX designers? How can that structure help us? Well, the answer is what I'm gonna call our hypothesis sprint. Now, the word hypothesis is pretty boring. Uh, hypothesis sprint isn't that engaging. So I wanna come up with this more jazzier idea of design idea sprints. Call them whatever you want to call them. Design concept sprints, design sprints, whatever you wanna call that, I don't mind. It's whatever language works in your organization with your people. But the idea here is that you're testing concepts, roots, ideas in your sprint. Now, that seems really obvious, but do you know how many projects we've all been in where, where there's not a really clear sprint goal? Um, as a creative, you don't get much leeway to be able to follow different routes or different approaches. It's put all your eggs in one and make that, make that one route work in two weeks, and that's a hell of a lot of pressure. So a design idea sprint kind of allows you a little bit of flexibility to try and fail. So, again, I'm not going to preach to the choir. Agile is very much learn something, make something, test something, and then repeat it, which comes together in this kind of spin cycle. My clicker is not really doing a great job. Um, develop, user test, and discover, which goes in this. Okay, this is familiar stuff that we do day and night. Well, when you look at that, how different is that to science? It isn't. So Agile is effectively, inherently, a scientific methodology of learning and testing and iterating, uh, which means we've already got a scientific structure baked into everything that we're doing already. We just need to do it in a better way. We put sprint cycles together. We end up with these three, put maybe a 12 sprint cycle. Uh, you put your discovery and your validation research in there. That's effectively user-centric design right there. So we've got user-centricity and science in one spin cycle, where the user research is informing the design continually. So let's just take that and apply this to design idea sprints. So idea one, one A, comes, carries on for an extra sprint, evolves, changes, moves along. You might wanna call these things roots. If you change the word from hypothesis to idea to root, again, depending on what language, the language that you use in the studio, you might be more of a root person. I'm just varying the language just to show you, to, to, to make it land a little bit easier, depending on which kind of design function you come from. But being able to do this, to do this for pitches, to do this for projects, all of this stuff, it, it just doesn't get done. And I trust me, it's the easy, safest way to produce good work quickly. Oops, sorry. But wait, we're already doing that, right? Well, we're doing this stuff. My delivery leader is set, setting up goals. I've got stuff in JIRA, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so there are warning signs. And these are warning signs that I hope are familiar to, to many of you, or maybe I hope then they're not familiar. These are things that tell me you're not being scientific enough or you're doing the wrong kinds of structural stuff or a lack of structure. Being feature-centric instead of needs-centric. Um, I know product is the big, sexy, new buzzword in our world today. Um, product owners have a tendency to be roadmap focused. They just live on their product walls with their product post-it notes, meditating into this weird matrix type thing. And it's all about, when's my feature gonna be released? When's the, my feature on my roadmap? Uh, and there's no discussion of user needs, and there's no mapping of user needs, there's no understanding of needs. At least, this is on my journey. Maybe you guys are working completely differently in a utopia. Um, what I'm seeing is, are, are people just being completely feature-centric? And 
if you're need-centric, everything else flows out. It's a bit like uh, what Brendan was saying previously about having that kind of central truth, the uh, critical user journey. You can change the execution of it, as, but your top guiding light stays, and it's the same here. If you stay need-centric, all of your features and everything you build is going gonna, is gonna to work well and with a level of confidence. When you stay, um, when you stay over-focused on, on features, you're two products and not enough user, in my humble opinion. The next one is checkbox activity. And I've seen this happen an awful lot within government, but it happens an awful lot in research, where people are just doing a thing and then saying, yes, I've done it. And there's no concern for the quality. It's all about activity. And this drives me nuts. So for example, and I'm going to probably never work in G for government again by saying this, but I'm going to say it because it's the truth. Um, one of the GDS recommendations is that you use at least five people in your sample, and of which one of those people should have a, a, a form of accessible, accessibility need. Now, if you're doing five people, we can talk about sample sizes and five and the Norman Nielsen thing. We'll argue it in the bar later. Um, you, what you can't do is take one person, i.e. 20%, and expect that one person to represent every single disability, every single accessibility need. Um, you couldn't even do that with a particular, if I was to take visual impairment, for example, there's a, a whole range of visual impairments within that. There's no way one person could ever represent that entire sample. So that's what I mean about checkbox ac activity. It's doing things because it seems like that's what the law says I have to do, but actually not actually thinking about what it means. Is that informing anything? Am I getting it with a level of confidence? So checkbox activity is unfortunately huge, and it's a real symptom of an immature digital marketplace. This, this one is great, rollback panic. Rollback panic is what happens when you see, you've seen a head of digital running around like a headless chicken. Uh, they've got their Excel spreadsheet that's been mailed through to them from their web analyst in the morning, and they're like, holy shit, conversion's gone down. Um, rollback, rollback, rollback. And what they'll do is they're going to speak to the dev teams, get them to roll back the previous version. Um, what that happened, this happens because there's a lack of structure in the way that you learn things. So if you don't have a one-to-one -one ratio, a, a, a clear mapping between change, so I've changed a thing and it has an, an effect, if you don't do that, you have no idea what attributed that, the attribution of that change. And that means you have to roll back because that's the last known good. That's the, the last time it worked but you don't know, if I move on again, what causes it to break. So that's a very symptomatic of a lack of structure in your thinking, in your methodologies. Um, you sh anytime you see rollback panic, it, it should be a massive, massive red flag. You need to stop what you're doing, not and release based on knowledge on single factors, or go MVT, but even then, I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment. I've got about three minutes left, so I'm going to have to pick things up. Um, effective design idea sprints. I'm going to go through these quite quickly. Um, define the idea in sprint planning. Pretty obvious. This shouldn't just be a design-only activity. Work with the entire team. There should be no surprises. Also, import, most importantly, work with your researcher and your content person to define their, the activity that you need them to help to support you. Simple team stuff. Agree a feedback methodology. Um, Make sure that you've got those success criteria agreed in advance. Now, in science, we talk about a priori and post hoc hypotheses. That sounds all sciencey. If you have an idea before you've done the stuff and it turns out as, as, it, as predicted, that's much more powerful than, than having kind of 2020 uh, vision in hindsight. So, what you can do is say, I think I'm going to try this way, and this is the metrics for success. And if your completely batshit crazy idea is successful, you've agreed it beforehand and people can't then backtrack. That's really, really important, especially if you're going to go for something really innovative. More rigor, more confidence. I was, this is what I was alluding to earlier. Do not be afraid to repeat tests. Don't be afraid to talk to your researcher and say, can you run that again for me? How confident are you? So repeat with, an, with a similar sample, a bigger sample. Uh, try different geography. So if you are uh, a healthcare provider, what response are you getting in Scotland compared to Wales, compared to England, or where, whatever? Look at different socioeconomics, rich people, poor people, everything in between. Uh, different contexts, different accessibility needs, increased diversity, and any other 
things. What you've got to be really careful is, is just saying, yeah, we did something. Um, we've learned from those three people that they like it, and then we're just going to use that across the board. Okay, challenge this stuff. Don't accept it. The more rigor, the more confidence you get, the more detail, the better, the better your output will be, and the more confident you'll be. None of this kind of hoping for success. You'll know it's going to be successful. Um, this is what I meant about unstructured MVT. I call them fishing expeditions, or in science we call them fishing expeditions. That's when you just go out there and you're just pretty unstructured. It's a bit like saying, I'm going to change a whole ton of features on the page. Like, it's like an A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K test. Um, the reason why you put structure in there, even with MVT, is because it, it avoids this rollback panic. Because you're gonna, you know what you're doing, and you're not having to guess, and you know what the outcome is going to be. Um, when I say structured MVT activity, I mean just a met methodological way of asking the questions or running the test. So now that we've learned that, we've banked that, what can we learn next? Rather than throwing it all against the wall and seeing what sticks, which, believe it or not, is scarily common. Um, comparison. Good old-fashioned manual A-B testing. Right? No one really does this anymore. Um, showing, this is a bad image, but it's, it was quick and dirty. At the top, the, the, the image of the person, the, the, the black individual there, is actually a group. So this is one group at the top seeing three different experimental conditions, a green, a blue, and an orange. Or the bottom one is between groups. So I've got three groups of people all seeing a different, all seeing a different experimental condition. We don't do any of this kind of work, and we rely all of it on MVT. And actually, it's not difficult to do. And do you know how much you can learn from both between and within groups? I won't go into it now. I'll talk to you about it afterwards. But I would strongly suggest you Google this stuff and think about where you can work it into your practices. It's very underplayed. It is 100% coming. Get ahead of the curve. One of the things I did mention in the blurb for this talk was about innovation versus optimization. And in an innovation project, you're trying to make something new. In an optimization project, you're trying to make something better. And this is all about the classic top-down, bottom-up stuff. So on the left-hand side, where you want to be really innovative, um, you have an idea, and you're kind of pushing it down to the audience and seeing how, it, how they respond. Whereas in an optimization project, it's much more bottom-up, because it's kind of asking the audience and finding out how they felt about things, and that bub bubbles up into your ideas. So the insight is the, the direction is where the insight's coming from. So in here, we're looking, did the idea work? So if I came up with this amazing for like a flying car or whatever it is, did it work? Was, it, did it, was, there, was there appeal? Um, did we get it right? Or I built this thing. What's wrong? Does it work for you? Where is the pain? And finally, by the way, sorry, my point here is, is that Science and this structure works for both. It's not inhibiting or, 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 la or, or stopping you from being creative. It's just structuring the insight that you get as a result of it. So how can scientific design be the catalyst for transformation? It's that magical T word that we literally hear in pretty much every meeting we're ever in. You have to show, not tell. But this is high visibility idea testing, or high visibility hypothesis testing. A, B, or champion challenger type stuff works incredibly well. There's no point putting it into Confluence, no point putting it onto Trello, or any of your other knowledge management stuff, because, frankly, no one's going there. Right? Putting them on the walls, by the lifts, at the end of your bank of desks, on whiteboard, the weedy whiteboard things, that's the way to do this stuff. Okay? You have to expose your activity to the rest of the organization, and you have to do it, use your design -y brilliance to do that. So you have to influence people, because they're going to walk past your desks, and they're going to just see this stuff out of the corner of their eyes. One time in, in 10, they'll actually stop and read it and get engaged and talk to their mates. Trust me, I promise you, if you do nothing else, do high visibility, high footfall activity. Surface it in a very clean, simple easy to digest way. So this one here, it's almost like an A-B test where you've got two variants of the same page. Um, 
I actually should have put a, a, a blob on here that says, you know, 2% increase in, in coercion on the right with a couple of bullet points. But it's, that's all, okay? Champion versus challenger. Again, same again, high visibility whiteboarding. So when you're taking these outputs, put them on the whiteboards, put them in the high footfall areas, let people see where the insight has gone into a solution. Make it really clear. Um, and finally, make show reels. As part of this show note, don't tell strategy, show stakeholders. So I make show reels using, using testing.com or whatever other uh, video footage I have, with consent, obviously. Um, do a 10 minute version for the team and then do a three minute version for the stakeholders because three minutes is already pushing their tiny little brain cells way out there. Keep it short and engaging and easy. Um, they will then show this to their mates and share it around and the magic will happen. So finally, my last two slides, takeaways. Practice applying scientific principles in your thinking. You're going to get a copy of these slides, so don't, don't worry so much. Look at that green slide where I talked about impartiality and rigor uh, and all of these things. Try to under work out what does that mean for you and who you want to be as a practitioner. How is it going to define you? How are you going to bake these into your cool core rule set? What's going to bother you or, or what's going to feed your passion? So get those principles into your thinking. Always be thinking in terms of idea testing terms. Okay, so we're talking about hypothesis testing. Ideas, hypotheses can come from anyone in the team. It is not just a preserve of researchers or designers or anybody else. Anybody can come up with those ideas, but try to get everybody thinking in terms of give us an idea, let's test it. Print out those Neil deGrasse Tyson five principles. Print them out, put them next to your bed, next to your desk, on your laptop background, anywhere you want. I want you to continually be reminded of these things and keep thinking to yourself, how can I nudge my own thinking along by applying this right here, right now? This is not high level grandiose stuff. This is right down highly applied stuff. You just gotta work out how do you get from the principle to me? And only you can do that. I can't tell you that. I can just give you the principles. You have to fit them into your life. Challenge everything. I spent too much time on that slide. You understand where I'm coming from. Be a rebel, change the status quo, shake things up. Uh, try design idea sprinting. So instead of having a feature-driven sprint, have it based around some kind of hypothesis, idea that you've got. How can we make our users' lives better? How can I take away pain? How can I make needs? Um, make designing for user needs your new guiding light. I'm sure probably many of you are already doing this, but make user need the unit of design, should we say, the unit of success. Uh, make designing, sorry, science is in the structure. It's the structure that keeps you safe. So ask yourself all the time, how confident am I? How sure am I before I let this thing go? I release this thing. Am I really sure? Now, some stuff, you don't have to have mission critical surety. It's not like we're putting a man in space or, or saving a, a child's life. You know, it's not, not like that. Some stuff you can hustle. You're going to have to work out the hustle point. When are you confident enough? And as I've just said, show, don't tell. Stakeholders don't listen to a bloody thing, but if you show them something that's engaging, they're gonna, you'll definitely pique their interest. Um, I've been really slack, pardon the awful pun, um, I've been really slack in not keeping up UX psychology. UX psychology is a channel I put together on YouTube to try to bring more science into UX, more psychology into UX. Um, I will be making more videos, but that's where, um, there's an introduction to UX psychology video which you might find interesting. Um, questions you can have to get me outside for. Um, and if you want to have any greater discussion, come get me on LinkedIn. That's where I tend to live and, and, and breathe. So that's it. So thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been useful to you. If um, any questions, come grab me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.